Well, the battle we were sure was going to happen didn't, and the one we weren't sure was going to happen did. Who could have foreseen such a thing? Perhaps Frigg the Gigia, who has once again blocked something terrible from happening, which is delightful. I suppose that having fortune-telling spellcasters is one side, one, one partial way to mitigate taking bad luck scaling, but I still, I still regret taking it. I'm not sure what I would have done instead, but, you know, you know. So many bad luck. Anyway, all of that aside, let's take a look at what's happened. So, his army, which I thought would stomp on our capital, has apparently retreated. Presumably he's noticed an enormous Pan army up here. And in all honesty, Pan is becoming one of the front runners in this game. I do not trust him. I suspect that he is going to snap up as many nations as he can in the mid game and then make a play for victory. Fortunately, both Catis and Marignol seem to be relatively solid nations to his south and his west. So if necessary, I could contact them and try and form some kind of anti-Pan coalition. Interestingly, the scrolling nature of the map means that Pan and Marignol are both surrounding each other north to south which is presumably tactically relevant, although I don't right now know how. Anyway, so this army did not go on our capital. It retreated back to here, probably to go deal with some other army. Our army moving from here to here encountered that army and destroyed it utterly. In fact, let's take a look at that. So this is slightly unusual to how I normally make this, make this work. I would normally look at the battle overview first, but it's pretty interesting to watch it happen. Let's put it on double speed just so we're not here forever. So he's got a single line of troops and then a secondary uh, block of more powerful troops that he's buffing. He's mostly using point buffs, which are powerful but small AOE buffs, which he's hoping to land on his sacreds to make them more powerful in addition to their already powerful bless. He's also got this enormous front line of infantry the purpose of a line of infantry like that marching across the battlefield is you usually tell it to attack rear, and then when it runs into a blob of enemy units, it wraps around it, forming a sort of a kitchen blender type appliance that just slowly eats away until they all flee, and then kills a bunch of them while they're fleeing because they're trapped in the, the semicircle. Of course, we have a narrow front line, uh, a bunch of worthless mercenaries, and a bunch of wolf riders that are going to cause problems with that. Meanwhile, we are summoning a shit ton of skeletons. Also worth noting, and it's kind of amusing to me, that his Mushushu chariots basically achieve nothing. These are interesting units. They're very powerful and they, ha they have a, a huge trample attack. They, they can't be surrounded very effectively, but they actually have two lives. The first amount of hit points is the charioteer, and once the charioteer is dead, it loses its ability to trample and instead starts uh, basically just being a single rampaging dragon. But the thing is, as an animal, that dragon has very low morale. So if you can kill the charioteer, it's as much of a threat to his troops as it is to mine. And I had all of my javelineers set to throw their javelins at big monsters. So they were able to kill the javelineer who has low hit points. When that happens, technically the unit dies and is then replaced by another unit. So the charioteer led dragon chariot dies and is replaced by just the dragon with a pointless empty chariot behind it. One of the reasons Mushushu chariots are so powerful is because that charioteer will respawn. If the dragon survives, it'll turn back into a dragon chariot at the end of the battle. Also, what a goddamn cacophony. Let's take a quick look at what's been happening with our army of the dead. Amusingly, giants will sometimes summon giant dead, which is very useful for us. We started out by summoning skeletons. This summons long dead, which are weaker. Well, I mean, they're about the same. This summons long dead, which are about the same as the uh, soulless, which are zombies. However, you can always summon long dead. You can't always summon soulless. Soulless have to be from the recently dead, which means we scripted our spellcasters to cast skeletons at the start of combat. And then when the AI took over, it started summoning zombies instead because you get more zombies per cast, but it does require there to be dead on the battlefield already. You can only summon as many corpses are actually lying on the battlefield. So the AI prioritizing that is amusing. At the start of the battle, it will summon tons of skeletons. And then in the middle of the battle, when there's a lot of people who've already died, it will start summoning zombies until it runs out of corpses on the actual literal battlefield. It actually tracks how many deaths have happened in the battle. And that's the number of corpses you can summon. Uh, and then after that, it goes back to summoning skeletons because it prioritizes those two spells much more heavily than other spells. So, by the time battle is properly joined, we are outputting so many d undead that it's just impossible for him to deal with it. Also, the undead are small enough 
that they can actually fit one into a square with one of our giants. Our size four giants can't fit two of them in a square, but a size four and a size two, that's exactly the amount you can fit in, which then means that those skeletons be almost become armor for my surviving giants. Because any individual melee hit is targets a square, so that means that it, you know, if you're hitting one guy in that square, you can't hit the other guy in that square. Just very useful for me. So here's the overview of that battle. Now, this might look intimidating. You know, we lost nearly half of our troops. Well, he lost two thirds of his troops, including one of his chariots and a significant number of these. And these will have retreated into random other provinces, which means that we can pick them off if we're quick. Unfortunately, we only killed one of his wizards, but this is much more of a problem for him than for me. Anyway, so this 94 units that we lost, more than half of those were mercenaries who were going to despawn in a couple turns anyway. And a significant, no another significant number of them were the wolf raiders. Only about a quarter of them were things that we care about. <laughs> um, and of those, we had plenty to lose. And we didn't lose any of our important units. So, a huge success. And also, interestingly, exactly the battle I wanted to take a couple turns ago. A couple turns ago, I suggested that he might split his forces if I, if I rat away enough of his terrain. He did. And I was able to do exactly what I planned to and kill half of his army while it was only half his army. Which means that my next plan is going to be to leave most of my wizards researching my capital, but I'm going to bring the rest of this army back to here, along with some reinforcements from here, to reclaim this province and finish off his 20 Maidens of the Moon that he has here, which are very useful. They're probably his most powerful unit that he's able to use en masse. They're expensive and can only be recruited in his capital. So once I, once this group and this group are in here, I'm going to reorganize them a little bit. I will then have enough Scrati to solely fuel my communions with Scrati, and I'm going to take four Scrati as a battery and eight Gigias to cast spells, along with all of the rest of my troops, and then just march north and try and seize as much territory as I can. At that point, I believe I will be able to stomp all over any of his armies, and also within a couple of turns, I will have those two spells that I mentioned previously on previous turns, which combined will basically destroy his armies without any real risk to me through fatigue damage. On top of all of that, we are now starting to run into money troubles a little bit. I know I should have more than half of my income each turn to play with, but all of that income is getting sunk into recruiting more wizards, which is what I need. I desperately need more wizards. Always need more wizards. Never stop casting. Always be summoning. It's not impossible that this army will march back here, but if that happens, these groups should be able to beat it even without access to vapors, based you know on the fact that I beat an equally sized army here with only this army, and I would, will have additional wage support. So probably a bad idea for him to come here. I might be wasting a turn of progress if I don't if I if I move here instead of going onwards. But you know what? Who cares? I want this province back. Anyway, that actually is all I want to talk about. Hello, friends. It is turn twenty-seven, and we've noticed some troubling things at large in the world. First off, two more thrones have been claimed. We are clearly moving into the mid-game now as people start snapping them up. I'm a bit irritated. I've clearly moved a bit slowly. I should have one of these by this point, but that's not the end of the world. So we now know where a couple more of these thrones are and which thrones they are, and guess what? I was kind of wrong about them. Other than that, we don't really have much to worry about, although the giant pig that's just taken control of this province might be a problem that we need to deal with at some point. It doesn't seem to be there, but this I think this is part of an event chain that eventually results in a giant pig attempting to take control of the province. Which just goes to show you can never trust the pigs, but we all knew that anyway. So geopolitically, there's a couple things I want to point out. One is that Man has started pushing into Uruk's territory as well. He's clearly trying to vulture away if several provinces before the end of end of this war, which is extremely frustrating for me because the disingenuous jumping in of Pangaea is already denying me provinces that I want. By rights, all of Uruk's territory should have been mine. I'm the one who picked a war with him. But the way this is going to end up is with me ha probably having seized very little of his territory while having done quite a lot of the work of fighting him, which is just frankly irritating. Pangaea is growing very large and is a nation which... Uh, <laughs> tends to run away with the game as it is one of the most powerful nations currently in the, in the meta. So if I'm worrying about that, well, I'm probably going to contact this turn or next turn, Catis and Marignan. Marignan I have a non-aggression pact with and Catis I have no real contact with whatsoever and ask them if they are interested in trying to deal with Pangaea before he becomes too much of a problem or try and coordinate and take care of him, unless they aren't interested in that, in which case I might have more of a problem on my hands, but also maybe I'll go fight man instead, you never know. The two seized thrones are these two, 
which as you can see are the inner throne over here and the throne of life over here, which is really surprising. I thought that this was going to be the throne of life. I now suspect it is in fact going to be the throne of Gaia. I thought that this was going to be the throne of fire or possibly um, one of the other ones, maybe the inner throne. It turns out that this, which I thought almost certainly was going to be the throne of fire, is the inner throne. It was a province full of fire monsters. What am I supposed to think? I still think that this might be the outer throne though. Other than that, once again, all we have to talk about is my scripting. So I'm going to seize this province next turn. This army might march in here, or it might not. If it marches in here, we'll probably kill it, because we're set up to do a mega turbo communion. As you can see, we now have four werewolves online to be batteries to fuel it, which means that we can have them just be the basis of an absolute fuckload of skeletons. However, it's also fairly likely that this will retreat to his capital, or possibly just push into these to try and get Pan away from his territory, which will be to my benefit, because <laughs> when I take this territory, I'm more likely to hold it. Which is kind of a baseless thing to say, but just feels natural. So, what is my actual scripting for this army? Well, I'm going to go over it in super brief, because I don't want to detail every individual character. Let's just take a look at the actual layout. This is, of course, our side of the battlefield. There's a middle section, and then, you know, even further, there's another copy of this in reverse for the opponent's side of the battlefield. So this is only one, this is only one third of the battlefield. We've got a line of javeliners crossing, stretching across the entire battlefield. I believe this is a double line. Their purpose is to prevent any enemy units from reaching my wizards. In front of them, we've just got a few more combat guys, but their job is to just tie up the enemy while the skeleton engine kicks into overdrive. Ignore these guys. They are not going to be here. They're heading home. We've got our two commanders in the middle where they're least likely to get hurt. We've got our werewolf battery. Then we've got over here our death mages who will be using blood magic to join the Sabbath. And over here we have our astral mages who will be using their innate astral magic to join the Sabbath and therefore don't need access to blood slaves. They will of course mostly be casting skeletons, but there's a couple of buff spells scattered in to reinforce the battery and make them survive longer. We've also got a couple scouts dotted around who won't be taking part in the combat, but they still get to note it on the layout even though they aren't present. So that should be pretty effective in the way that we've already seen it be effective. I don't think he has the mage support to cause real problems against the skeleton army right now. So with a bit of luck, we'll see a thrilling battle next turn, or possibly all we will see is me destroying a little bit of province defense. I'm also moving this guy in with the intention of building a fort here next turn. Um, that might not happen. That might be pointless. We don't know. We'll find out later whether it was a bad decision. As you can see, this one's already picked up an affliction. Anytime you take damage in combat, you have a chance of gaining an affliction, which is a permanent wound. If you have regeneration, you have a chance to avoid afflictions happening. But when they're taking damage every turn because, <laughs> because of the way communions work, they are going to rack up afflictions fairly quickly. It's just very funny to me that the first one we gained is Battle Fright. Like, wow, it would sure be a problem if this combatant in this battlefield conflict weren't asleep the entire time. Fortunately, he has nothing to be afraid of because, as I said, he's asleep. Anyway, that's going to be all for this turn. Join me next time and we'll find out whether an actual interesting battle has taken place or if I'm just going to mop up some dregs yet again. It's turn 20 and <laughs> stuff is happening, but not particularly much interesting stuff to talk about. I'm not going to go all over all of this because most of it's just more of the same. But we did get slightly bumped by Marion. He came in afterwards and then uh, promptly had most of his troops die on me, which sucks for him. But fortunately, he decided not to take this as some kind of act of war. And in, he, in fact, he approached me to apologize which I appreciate, and so everything seems to be cool between us right now. Also, you may notice that he has... His his knights have achieved 45 kills, but we only had 11 losses. Uh, that's because the kill tracker counts number of things killed, regardless of whether or not they were on your side. So friendly fire and stuff gets listed as well under the kills, but so does killing skeletons I summon, which, you know, it's like, good, good job, guys. You killed an absolute shitload of pointless skeletons that don't gain you anything by killing. Thus is the power of skelly spam revealed. So not much to say about the global layout. I really should get back in the habit of moving my scouts around, but I've been very focused in on Uruk lately. I should definitely send out another wave of scouts into the surrounding neighboring nations pretty soon. I haven't talked to Marignan Orchitis about... Pangaea yet. I really ought to, but uh, I've been really busy the last couple of days and haven't had time for diplomacy. So what are we doing? Well, we're starting to recruit Morgigius now that we have another lab here. We're moving a Vetihag here to build a lab to recruit Morgigius. We really should have him building some temples when we have spare cash. 
other than that, we're pretty much just logistically shuffling our guys around. We're doing blood hunting and patrolling to prevent the unrest from blood hunting. We're attempting to bring a couple more wolf rider battalions up north to try and steal a couple more provinces before they get snapped up by Pangaea. And incidentally, if we manage to take these provinces, which would include the capital, and uh, surround this province, we've got a good argument for Pangaea just ceding that province to us. If we contact him and say, I'll give you, you know, 200 gold for that province, he'll might, he might say yes. But that's assuming we manage to seize enough of this territory. So this has been a pretty successful loadout. It seems to have worked well. We did lose a fair few of our giants, but honestly, we have way more giants than we need. The skeletons should be doing most of the fighting, but because we brought too many giants to this battle in the first place, it takes a while for the skeletons to sort of trickle through the front line of, of giants to actually reach the front line of the enemy, which means that um, the giants spend more time fighting than really they ought. I could uh, rearrange them and keep them on the back line, but I'm a little bit worried now that we're going into some potentially bigger fights. I suspect this unit's going to retreat to the capital, but you never know, and we'll get a better picture when we're in this province because we'll be able to see what's in all of these provinces. I've also got wolf riders moving over here to go cause problems elsewhere. And interestingly, we have finally got our first Scratty with a nature random. So I've got a few people making items today. That's to have enough equipment to equip a Scratty thug, which will be very useful soon. This guy's probably going to be what's called a Foul Vapors bomb. You remember I was talking about Foul Vapors previously as a tactic for Short King to use? Well, if you have a disposable wizard who can cast it, it can be very effective to just have a, a wizard with a few bodyguards sit in a province, cast Foul Vapors, and kill an entire army. It's mostly a, a tactic that is more effective when it is a surprise to your opponent, but a Scratty, well-equipped, can be perfect for that role, so I'm going to hang on to him and see if he can be incredibly useful later on. He will have to be given a Thistle Mace to boost his nature by one, because some magic items will boost your, your paths by one point, in order to get him into a position to start casting it, but that's fine. Like, it'll be a very effective tactic, and probably not one that's expected. There are nations who love to use Foul Vapors, Katis is one of them, but um, it's not always expected on these guys, because the only way you can viably do it is by putting a powerful boosting item on a, on a mage that you only have a 25% chance of even having. Anyway, that's going to be all for today. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch, and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Coffee or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.